For example, scientific reports of an insect called the walking stick in California have shown that walking sticks right now are splitting into two species, one of which prefers to hang out on one kind of plant and the other of which prefers to hang out on another type due to camouflage regions. These species can almost, um, uh, can all, these two populations can almost be considered separate species. And this sort of process therefore happens and it happens today. Now we're able to analyze, Darwin couldn't do this, what goes on by genetics. And genetics has shown us that these sort of isolating mechanisms which divide species into two can develop in just a few years. In the case of fish, 60 or 70 years. In the case of mice, as few as a few hundred years. And in the case of flies and other microorganisms, perhaps just a few generations. So it's extraordinary that not only do these changes continue to take place, but we can study them with modern genetic mechanisms. Now, these ideas have implications. And the implications are that we ought to be able to look at the fossil record and find a record of common ancestry. It turns out we can't. Um, we've known for years, for example, that swimming mammals like whales and dolphins have evolved from terrestrial mammals, and they did so about 80 or 90 million years ago. And it turns out that the oldest known living whale called, uh, sorry, the oldest known fossil whale um, up to about 20 years ago, which was called Basilosaurus, and this is a Basilosaurus skeleton, is remarkably transitional. It doesn't have a blowhole, it still breathes from the very tip of the nose. It actually has tiny little hind legs, or a pelvic girdle here, concealed inside the skeleton. So it clearly is an intermediate form, but a lot of people who might be critical of evolution might say, yeah, well, if this really happened, where are the intermediates? Well, that's a good question. It turns out that about 15 years ago, a group of investigators in the Middle East began to discover fossils that clearly were whale-like fossils. And once they realized that this was where this evolutionary process took place, they began to look harder. And when they, look harder, when they looked harder, they found a series of fossils that were remarkably intermediate, fossils that clearly were terrestrial organisms that had begun to adapt to the ocean. So how many different species did they find? One or two to plug up the gaps? Well, no fewer than five, and recent estimates suggest perhaps a dozen or more. And we now understand in great detail how mammals made the transition back to the water and where modern whales and dolphins came from. And it's an evolutionary process that we understand, not completely, because we don't understand anything completely in science, but we certainly understand it well enough to know that evolution drove the change. And this sort of discovery occurs all the time. This is an article April of this year from the Wall Street Journal pointing out that new discoveries continue to answer questions on evolutionary theory. And in this case, it was the spectacular discovery of an intermediate fossil in the Canadian Arctic that shows very clearly how, lobed, how the fins of lobed fin fishes evolved into the forelimbs of terrestrial or land-dwelling vertebrates. So the intermediate forms continue to show up. And we can look at the fossil record anywhere and see examples of new species formation. Here, for example, is the development of a new species. It actually turns out to be a diatom by this process of diversification, exactly what Darwin suspected in the fossil record. And this species became increasingly diverse around three and a half million years ago, split into two. These two species went their separate ways. And as it turns out, they are both still with us today. So we see examples like this all the time. But if you're really passionately interested in evolution, you might say, well, you know, that's a diatom. I mean, nobody really cares about diatoms. Show me a species that I'm really interested in. So I figured I would do that today. What you see here is the fossil record of another species. Looks remarkably similar to the last one. And just like it, in this case, about two million years ago, it underwent a diversification. It split into two major lines. Um, they existed side by side for about a million years. Um, this one went extinct. This one continued to evolve. And what you see here is the size of a very important organ in all of these species. And as you can see, this guy is still with us to the present day. Now, I don't know if this looks familiar to you or not, but it should. And the reason for that is it's us. What you're looking at is a fossil record showing the development of the brain size in human beings. Um, we make an arbitrary split between the Australopithecines 
and our genus Homo. That split occurred about two million years ago. Human beings or pre-humans lived side by side with Australopithecines for about a million years before they went extinct, and we might have had something to do with that. And the line leading to us uh, showed a rapid increase in brain capacity in just the last million or so years. Many people who are critical of evolution literally refuse to believe that we have intermediate fossils that connect us to our pre-human ancestors, um, but we certainly do. And every year we discover more of them. And these are not fragmentary re remains. These are not bits of a jawbone or a piece of a tooth. In many cases, they are complete skulls that show us a great deal about these individuals and a great deal about what they were capable of. One of these skulls was reported in the journal Nature several years ago. It's called Kenyanthropus, the guy on this side. And when I opened the issue of Nature, I saw um, a summary in the paper showing not just Kenyanthropus, which is right here, but showing all of the fossil species, who is related to whom, or who we think is related to whom. Um, and these are species that lived in just the last five million years leading to us. And I opened this, and I looked at this, and I had one of those really weird moments. I looked at it and said, I've seen that before. Where have I seen it before? How could I have seen it before? Because this is the latest issue of a scientific journal. They must have drawn this diagram up. But I was positive that I had seen that diagram before, and I couldn't imagine what it was. So I thought about it, yeah, I got better things to do, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. I don't know when I do my good thinking when I'm unconscious or not, but I woke up the next morning and I thought, I know where I saw it before. I saw it before in the origin of species. Unintentionally, that summary of the human fossil record is literally a dead ringer for that back of the envelope sketch that Charles Darwin put in the origin of species. This was his sketch as to what evolution would look like if we could capture all the intermediate forms and, f and visualize all of the evolutionary speciation events. Lo and behold, what we know right now around our own species matches that in a way that I think Darwin would never have anticipated. So the human fossil record turns out to be an almost perfect match for Darwin's rough back of the envelope sketch of evolution. Now we live, as all of you know, from your education in a molecular age. And so far I've just been talking about fossils. So a fair question is, what about the molecular evidence? Does it support the idea of evolution? This is the cover of the scientific journal Nature, published almost exactly a year ago today. And it has in it the chimpanzee genome DNA sequence. And this is, this is, these are a few lines from one of the papers in this issue. And I wanted to show you what one of the authors who worked on this study actually wrote. And what he wrote is that more than a century ago, Darwin posited that humans share recent common ancestors with the great apes in Africa. Modern molecular studies have spectacularly confirmed this prediction. So molecular studies support it, and they support it in a very dramatic way. Now, as I'll tell you after the break, today is a special day for me, because exactly one year ago, I was on the stand being cross-examined in a trial on ev the issue of evolution in federal court in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And at that trial, we had to decide how were we going to bring this brand new evidence, because it was only a couple of weeks old at the time, into the courtroom in a way that would make this dramatic point with the judge. So I want to show you how we did this, because molecular evidence can be complicated. Let's take the hypothesis of common ancestry, namely the hypothesis that we share a common ancestor with chimps, orangs, gorillas, and the other great apes. Now, the fossil evidence for this is overwhelming. The anatomical evidence is good. The genetic evidence is extremely strong. But you know, there's something funny about it. We human beings have 46 chromosomes. All the other great apes have 48. Now, if you studied biology, and I think most of you have, you know that those 46 chromosomes we have are actually 23 pairs. Each of you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. Baby chimp gets 24 pairs, 24 from mom, 24 from dad. So where's our missing chromosome pair? What happened to it? Is it possible that in the line that led to us, a pair of chromosomes just went missing, just got tossed out? The answer to that is no. We know way too much about primate genetics. The loss of a whole chromosome pair would be fatal. Be fatal in us, be fatal in gorilla, be fatal in the orangutan. You wouldn't even get past embryonic development if you lost all the genes on a whole chromosome. So the only possibility is that during the evolution of the line that led to us, one of the pairs of chromosomes in one of these pre-human ancestors must have gotten fused together, must have gotten stuck. So instead of having 24 pairs, two of them are stuck together in us. That's why we have 23. 
Now that, as it turns out, is a test.